Okay, so uh, I'm gonna give a presentation on a topic. Uh, it's really a diagnosis that, uh, that I kind of hate to, to see whenever I see a patient referred to me with this diagnosis, failed back syndrome. Um, so I, I figure I would go ahead and, and discuss uh, this, this diagnosis in general and give some examples of why the diagnosis may not actually be, be correct. So uh, these are my disclosures. So the history of failed back surgery syndrome uh, it, uh, starts uh, after 1934, uh, after the seminal paper by Mixter and Barr when uh, uh, disc herniation was found to be the cause of back pain and sciatica. Um, so after 19, this paper from 1934, spine surgery became uh, very popular. Uh, and as spine surgery became increasingly popular, so did descriptions of uh, bad outcomes from spine surgery. And these were initially described as post-laminectomy syndrome and later uh, uh, took the form of the, uh, of the failed back syndrome uh, diagnosis. So a PubMed uh, review, when you use the search terms failed back surgery syndrome, uh, shows that uh, this as an entity in terms of diagnosis uh, has become increasingly common. And you can see that the, it almost looks like an exponential curve uh, in terms of the utilization of, of these words uh, in, in literature uh, about it. The various definitions for failed back surgery syndrome uh, and they essentially uh, uh, stem from the theme uh, that you have persistent uh, or recurrent or worsening pain uh, after one or more spine surgery procedures. Um, that essentially is the, the central uh, theme amongst all of the various definitions that you see uh, for failed back surgery syndrome. And uh, Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's not uncommon to have uh, uh, persistent spinal pain uh, after surgery, you know, anywhere from 20 to 40% of the time, according to some of these uh, pain management uh, uh, articles that have been published. You know, if you want to find uh, information about uh, persistent pain after spinal surgery, it, it's, it's usually not the orthopedic and neurosurgery literature where you're gonna find this. You're gonna find this in, in the pain literature because as you would expect, uh, these patients are being treated by pain doctors very often and, and uh, it's, it's the pain doctors that are really gonna be publishing the reality of, of, of uh, how common pain is uh, after spine surgery. So, uh, the fact that pain is persistent after spine surgery uh, should be of interest to us because there are reasons uh, for it. There are various different reasons. So why can a patient have persistent spinal pain following surgery? Uh, is it a, an alignment problem? Uh, do they potentially have a site of chronic infection? Uh, uh, do they have another part of the anatomy that's causing the problem? For example, the SI joint. Uh, does the patient have pseudoarthrosis? Is there persistent stenosis? Or, or is it a combination of all of these things? There are a variety of reasons why uh, patients may have persistent spinal pain after surgery. So it's important uh, to note that a very common cause of pain after surgery is is a failure to correct the deformity. Uh, you know, we uh, uh, in the grand scheme of of spine surgery, only recently have we been able to see that uh, the uh, clinical impact of spine surgery and its relationship with uh, health related quality of life measures uh, and its association with sagittal balance. Uh, it, it, in the grand scheme of spine surgery, it's only relatively recently that we've discovered this. And so, so we have a spectrum of, of, of uh, spine surgeons who may not appreciate this and hence uh, have been uh, creating uh, situations where patients may have a failure of deformity correction. So we'll, we'll move on to uh, various examples of, uh, of, of surgeries uh, that could be classified as failed back syndrome when in reality it was a failure to 
uh, completely uh, perform uh, uh, surgery uh, to address both deformity and various other factors. So this is a 76-year-old physician, a status post lumbar decompression uh, with severe worsening back pain and leg weakness. Uh, imaging was consistent with residual foraminal stenosis, and rightfully so, I think the referring doctor didn't do an aggressive decompression because he obviously was worried about the scoliosis, but this is not a typical candidate for a decompression. So uh, that being the case, uh, given his age, uh, we wanted to provide something that would not completely correct his uh, imbalance, but uh, partially uh, correct it and also give us the latitude to provide a uh, better uh, 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 decompression. So th this essentially is, is uh, what, what was done, uh, a partial correction uh, and stabilization of the critical levels, with, and he uh, felt substantially better uh, and actually was still working as a psychiatrist um, and uh, had returned to work uh, uh, shortly after this, this surgery. So in this case, the cause of the failed back syndrome was uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the failure to completely decompress the neural foramina uh, and the uh, uh, failure to address any of the, of the sagittal balance. As you can see on the AP, uh, he has a more of a harmonious uh, scoliosis after the surgery and, and did very well. This is an example of a patient with a previous L3 to L5 fusion uh, with chronic pain requiring a spinal cord stimulator. She did not have much of a radicular component to her pain, uh, but uh, had a significantly uh, collapsed disc space at L2-3 and was having uh, some sagittal imbalance. Uh, as you can see on these, these uh, uh, pictures here, that disc space at 2-3 is collapsed. Again, this would be uh, a patient who would be classified as a failed back uh, by, by definitions uh, that have been established. Uh, this, this, uh, this patient uh, was really uh, 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 not having much of a radicular component, but was pure back pain. Uh, and she had a, 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 a sagittal imbalance as well. Uh, so for this case, uh, we uh, ended up uh, uh, doing a, a prone x uh, And as you can see uh, depicted in these photos, uh, this was the, the approach. And uh, ultimately, uh, we, we gained access uh, to the disk space and distracted it open. Uh, and we're able to put in this cage to help elevate that completely collapsed disc height. Uh, depicted here, you can see the disc height elevation. Uh, we did a percutaneous posterior fixation uh, and attached to the existing construct. Uh, and you can see uh, the results over here showing improved lordosis and improved sagittal balance. So in, in that situation, the failed back syndrome was, was the uh, adjacent segment disease. You know, and adjacent segment disease doesn't mean that the previous surgeries had failed. It's just the fact that the patient needs more surgery. Again, another, another example of a patient with an L2 to S1 decompression infusion. This patient unfortunately developed pseudoarthrosis and further disc space collapse and retropulsion of disc material or vertebral body material into the canal. Uh, this was a patient who needed a larger surgery with larger diameter screws, augmentation. Uh, 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 you can see uh, there was a correction of the sagittal balance. We did a three column osteotomy at L4. Uh, and uh, inserted some a, a cage into the L45 and L5S1 disc spaces in order to provide some anterior column support. Uh, this patient had a re re reconstruction uh, that resulted in an improved sagittal uh, imbalance uh, and, and did very well. You can see with, with the uh, vertebral augmentation, she was able to maintain uh, the uh, integrity of, of the fixation uh, and uh, again, this, the, the, the failed back in this situation was uh, the multiple surgeries that the patient previously required to do the decompression followed by instrumentation, followed by hardware failure and pullout. So that was the cause of that patient's failed back. 
So uh, moving on uh, to another uh, example of a failed back, this is an interesting case uh, of a 49-year-old uh, with a, uh, uh, a loss of lumbar lordosis and a, uh, a, a disc space uh, that was uh, uh, kyphotic. Uh, uh, my first approach to this, she also had some foraminal stenosis at L5-S1. Uh, I initially treated this patient with a standalone ALIF. Uh, her pain did not get better, and I thought maybe the standalone ALIF wasn't providing adequate fixation, and maybe perhaps I didn't get enough of an indirect decompression. Uh, her symptoms were in the L5-S1 distribution. Uh, so we followed this with a posterior instrumented fusion with foraminotomies. She still did not get better. Uh, so finally, uh, you know, uh, after, uh, this was back in 2015 and 2016 when there was increased popularization of the SI joint as the etiology of, uh, of, of, of pain, especially in the setting of an L5-S1 fusion. And so finally, uh, you know, it, it came to my discovery that this patient really wasn't having as much of an L5-S1 uh, decompression, but was having uh, SI joint dysfunction. And uh, after this uh, surgery uh, with fixation in the SI joints, uh, this patient had a very positive Fortin finger test and very positive pain with uh, maneuvers of the SI joint. She, she, she got better after this, after this surgery with uh, uh, the, uh, uh, addressing the SI joint. So this failed back syndrome was due to uh, the diagnostic dilemma associated with L5-S1 radiculopathy versus SI joint dysfunction, and the L5-S1 fusion only made her SI joint dysfunction more, more prominent. So another example, persistent back pain after an L5-S1 T-lift. Uh, so as you can see, that the, the decompression was satisfactory. Uh, we followed this patient and, and tried to see if she was getting better, and, and she wasn't. A uh, CT scan about a year and a half to two years after the surgery showed that there was really uh, not enough bone growing uh, in the disc space, and this was essentially uh, a pseudoarthrosis. Uh, so repeat surgery with additional an additional cage on the other side, and uh, during surgery we appreciated that the screws were actually loose. Uh, even though you can't see it on the CT, sometimes uh, screws do not appear to be loose on the CT due to the artifact from the screw itself, and, and you can't appreciate the degree to which the screws are loose. So this patient did, did miraculously well after, after this uh, revision surgery and had complete resolution of her symptoms. So in conclusion, uh, uh, the proper diagnosis of patient's pain is critical uh, and you have to listen to your patient. There's a tendency for us to do a surgery and for a patient to have residual symptoms and for us to sort of stop listening to it. To, uh, and you, you really have to listen. If Chances are that if the patient is having persistent complaints, there, there's usually something that you can find uh, that would you know, be potentially addressable. So if, if we label all of our patients that has, as having a failed back syndrome, uh, uh, it, it basically doesn't get us closer to the problem and, and the ability to address and fix the problem. And, and when using correctly, uh, the term of failed back syndrome can have medical legal implications to suggest that the surgery was done incorrectly when may not, that may not necessarily be the case. And uh, carrying the label of failed back syndrome can potentially prevent the patient from getting the care uh, that they need. And for this reason, uh, the, uh, there's a movement to remove failed back surgery syndrome from the ICD uh, classification system. And uh, for the ICD-11 uh, system, it's going to be called persistent spinal pain syndrome. Uh, and uh, that's, there's uh, an algorithm uh, embedded in this paper uh, published in January 2021 that shows the different subtypes of persistent spinal pain syndrome, and it's going to be a more targeted way to help diagnose and treat these patients.